If you're struggling to pay off debt or you know someone who is, it might be because of these five things. Surprisingly, as important as it is to know the numbers mm -hmm. when you're calculating debt, there are some other factors to consider. And among those are habits which might actually be keeping you in debt. In this video, we'll give you practical examples from our own life each step of the way, and we'll give you some tools that you can use that will help you to actually pay off debt faster. Hi, I'm Larry. And I'm Hope. And you're with Under the Median, where every week we talk about practical frugality. Let's dive right into the topic of debt. The first habit is that you may be not intentionally shopping. Now, we have to give a shout out to one of our viewers named Will Mike, who actually left a very insightful comment on one of the programs a week or two ago. And as soon as I read his words, I went, ah, oh, that's it, that's it, exactly. That's how I would synopsize this habit. He talked about intentional shopping. He said, you know, with the price of inflation and with goods going up, I would say this is the best time ever to practice intentional shopping. So what do we mean by intentional shopping? It means shopping with a purpose. So where before we all might just go out and just kind of peruse a store <laughs> and we might have a vague idea of what we're buying, intentional shopping is planning making a list and sticking to it, going to the store, getting those items and getting out. We always recommend the get in, get out idea when it comes to shopping. And with good reason, because marketers have done a lot of research and they figured out that the longer you are in a store, any store, statistically, the more money you spend. Look, we've all been down that rabbit hole, right? So you go to Wayfair and you start looking at maybe new sofas, like <laughs> maybe I'm looking at new sofas right now. Are you looking at and new sofas? I am. <laughs> Oh. Surprise. So, so you go there and you just start looking at sofas and then pretty soon you like you're 30 or 40 pages down the rabbit hole and you've gone from sofas to matching chairs to ottomans to artwork for the walls and pretty soon you got the whole room completely pre-bought in your head and all you did was go there with the intention of replacing your 34 year old futon. So that's how it goes. That is not intentional shopping. Intentional shopping is deciding ahead of time what your budget is for that futon, what sort of style you might like for that futon. Deciding a lot of stuff ahead of time and then intentionally shopping for what you want and then ignoring what is not on that list. We are huge proponents of making lists. I think it's kind of like shopping with your foot on the brake. You want to make sure that you're holding back from making an impulsive purchase mm -hmm. and intentionally researching a product at the store, that's fine. Maybe you want to go and check out the quality. You want to look and see, will this sofa fit me? You know, I'm kind of tall. Some sofas aren't, aren't uh, going to match. They're so, not built for six foot four. They're just not. <laughs> right. So, so you might want to do your due diligence, but keep in mind, you're not spending money. Leave the checkbook at home and do your shopping that way. Now that we've given you a practical application of my little foray into looking at futons recently on Wayfair, we promised you kind of a practical exercise that you could use for each one of those tips. So here's the practical exercise. This is what we call asking the four important questions before you make a purchase. There are four questions you should always ask yourself before you plop down that cold hard cash or before you slide that card. And I think this is a point of defining whether it's mm -hmm. a want or or a need. Oh, absolutely. So I think the first question has to be, do I need this? And the second question that sounds an awful lot like it, but really has a totally different meaning is, do I need this now? Oh, that's a loaded question. Yeah. So after you've quantified <laughs> whether this is actually need, is this something that you have to purchase right at this very minute? The third question would be, do I have money set aside in my budget already to pay for this item. In other words, have I planned on making this purchase ahead of time in a way that will not impact my budget? And the fourth question you wanna ask before you purchase anything is, how will this purchase impact 
the other goals that I already have made. So let's say that our goal is to take a family vacation and we decide to squander some money on something that has nothing to do with a family vacation. And we may wind up four months down the line uh, needing to scale back that vacation. And that would be very disappointing for everybody involved. <laughs> You know, I, th I see this kind of like a row of dominoes. Once you tip one over, so many more can move. So you have to really be able to think carefully on how making this purchase will affect everything else that you're also working on in your budget. Tell us in the comments section, do you shop intentionally? And have you been down the Wayfair rabbit hole just like I have and found yourself, you know, all of a sudden wanting not just a sofa, but everything that goes with the sofa? I tend to go down the Amazon rabbit hole. <laughs> this you know, is true. You know how it is? the tech, definitely. You know how it is? You find one item you're interested in, and maybe you've done quite a bit of research on it. So you're looking at that one item, and you scroll down after you've looked at the comments, and you get down to the bottom, and it says, other people have purchased these things yes. as well. And then you look at them and go, oh, wow, that, yeah, I could use that and that. And this, would, this accessory would go good here with this item. That's a <laughs> rabbit hole. And they intentionally walk you down that if you're not careful. The second thing, the second habit that you may be indulging in is you might actually be panicking. You know, these can be scary times that we're living in. We're seeing the costs of everything that we purchase, everything we use, anything that has to do with money is all going up. And we're wondering, how are we going to make ends meet? Yeah. And that can cause us to react in fear. Once we start acting in fear, then we start making irrational decisions. Here's what happens. That fight or flight reflex that happens to all of us kind of goes into high gear. So you are literally like living on adrenaline and you are making decisions, not on the basis of have you thought through these decisions, but on the basis of you want to make that feeling go away. <laughs> Anything that will relieve that constant underlying like anxiety you're feeling. And so as human beings, we think I just got to do something. And so you start doing something, but that something may not be the right thing, or it may not actually be the best thing that will help drive you toward paying off that debt. So calculated decisions are super important, especially now when everybody is on edge and everybody has a heightened level of concern. We do too. So we totally and completely get it. You know, I just thought of a way to kind of help us react a little bit to possible panic. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're angry, let's switch it over to anger. Okay. When your anger is, is up, you don't tend to react and make good decisions. And sometimes it's a good idea to just back off, mm -hmm. give it some time, cool down, and then approach the problem again. And I think the same has to do with panicking and fear. Maybe we just need to take a little time. Mm -hmm. How about go for a walk, go for a hike, get out in nature, go for a bike ride, go for a swim, whatever, whatever you can do. Get a little time out and some time to pull back and get perspective. I think that might help us all to be able to deal with the situations that we're facing. Yeah, that's really spot on advice about how to reduce the stress level. And once that stress level is down, then you're going to be able to think clearly about what your options are. Are. So what's the practical application for this tip? Bring those stress levels down, do what you need to do in order to practice mindfulness. And then if you've watched this for any length of time, you know it's coming. You need to make a list of <laughs> ways that you are going to reduce that debt. This wouldn't Practical be a, ways. This wouldn't be a prioritized list, would it? <laughs> this, it would be a prior. <laughs> wait, I'm going to do it. Prioritized list. <laughs> that means the most important things go at the top of the list. Now, you didn't let me get the sound effect, and you got to do that longer. Okay, wait. Okay. It's a prioritized list with the most important things at the top of ways that you are going to reduce that debt. Because once we have it written down and we start working that list, then internally we begin to understand and believe that we can reach the goal. Super you know, uh, important. You know, I think writing things down really gets stuff into perspective. Mm -hmm. It's it, it seems like if, if it's in our head, it can get amplified, jumbled, mm -hmm. scrambled. But once you write something down, it's like clear, concise, workable, doable. 
Here's the third habit. The third habit is that you are not focused on a goal. So he just talked about the importance of writing things down. We said write down ways that you're gonna reduce that debt, but the other thing we want you to do is write a list of specific goals. You should always have a list going of short, medium, and long-term goals. Why? Why do we tell you all the time, make a list of goals? Because it's very simple. If you will write down your goals and if you will track the goals, you have a 70% greater chance of reaching those goals. There's something that happens. He's absolutely right. Larry's right. When it's in your head, you, it's, it's nebulous. It doesn't feel real. But when you write it down and you put it in front of your face, all of a sudden it is real. And so mindset wise, it will trick your mind into understanding you better bring this to the top of the priority list and get going on it. Really, the list of goals is just mm -hmm. like a map. It gives yeah. you a direction, a pathway. Mm -hmm. It shows you your destination, tells you how long it's going to take to get there. Uh, a map is a very clear way to get you from where you're at to where you want to go. So setting goals is exactly like that. Now, of course, today we all have GPSs in our phones or in our car, or maybe we have a wife that tells us where we should go and how we should drive. And a wife that may or may not tell you the wrong direction to turn. <laughs> Sorry, honey. <laughs> so, but your GPS probably will not do that. But it's really important to note that if you don't have a written list of goals, it's not just that you are driving without a GPS. It's like you are driving without a GPS and you are driving blindfolded because you don't know exactly where you are going. So make sure that you have a written list of goals. And if you need some help with that, we actually have a free set of goal trackers and we'd be really happy happy to send it to you absolutely free. There'll be a link to request it in the description of the video. And by the way, Hope and I do not recommend driving blindfolded. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if you're finding this video helpful or informative or even slightly amusing, give it a thumbs up for us, will you? That helps us with the YouTube algorithm. And if you haven't subscribed, we'd love to have you as a member of the Under the Medium family. Hit that subscribe button and make sure you turn on the bell notification so YouTube will let you know when we drop a video twice a week. And you've all heard that song, I've Got Algorithm. Oh, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a popular it's one. It's absolutely. Doesn't everybody know that song? <laughs> I've Got Algorithms. Yep. It's there. The next item that might be keeping you from getting out of debt is you're not focusing on the right numbers. Now, I'm going to preface it by saying that what we're about to tell you may feel counterintuitive, but stick with us. I'm going to explain to you why I'm about to tell you this. Too many people spend a whole lot of time focusing on how much they owe and not enough time focusing on how much they've already paid off. If you owe $50,000 in student debt, but you've paid $10,000, you've got $40,000 left to pay off and you spend all of your time fixating on that $40,000. It will feel immense. It will feel like you're never going to get the end of paying off that debt. But if you allow yourself to say, wait a minute, I paid $10,000 off of that student loan. I paid it off in 12 months. I have made incredible progress at chipping away at that debt that feeling of celebrating what you have accomplished will go a long way in helping you to pay off the remainder of the debt. So are we telling you don't know what you owe? Of course, we're not telling you that. You need to know how much you still owe. But we're telling you to allow yourself to celebrate the progress that you make along the way because that feeling that you have will keep you continuing forward in paying off the debt. I have a great analogy for that. Oh, good. So there is a really steep hill in Peoria. It's called mm -hmm. Forest Park Nature Drive. And the hill, when you're looking at it in your car, 
it looks like it goes straight up to the bluff, to the top mm -hmm. of the bluff. It is really steep. I don't know yeah. what percent grade it is, but it's got to be it's got to be over 12 percent it is it's like colorado mountain <clears throat> steep it is well, i think it's even steeper than some of their yeah. highways out in colorado so um i wanted to ride up that hill because it was there so true. i got behind my bike got out on the bike and i looked at the hill and i was in pretty good shape by this time this was back when i had a little old 10 speed and i started out and instead of focusing on the top of the hill, oh my gosh, how am I ever going to get up to the top? I just started riding and I focused on the ground right before me. And then I noticed it got harder and harder to pedal, but it just kept focusing directly ahead of me. And pretty soon I saw the crest of the hill mm -hmm. come, the stop sign at the yeah. top where the road was, and I was at the top. And the same is true with your mm -hmm. debt. You concentrate on just what you can pay what you can pay on that debt. Don't worry about the load that you have ahead of you. Just keep working on it. Pay what you can as you go. And pretty soon you're going to get to the top and you'll have it all paid off. Now, here's the practical application part. I just want to remind you that we do have a set of free debt trackers. So they're nice like pictures. You can print them out and then you color them in as you get closer and closer to paying off that debt. And they are super helpful. We've heard from a lot of folks who have uh, gotten them free from us that it's been really helpful to them in paying off their debt. So once again, that's the practical application for this point. You want a set of those goal trackers. They're free. There is a link in the video description to request them. Number five. You're not focused on the right emotions. Now, the reason that we earn, save, and spend money the way that we do has more to do than just physical money. It has to do with who we are as a person. It has to do with our worldview. It has to do with our core values, our morals, and importantly, our emotions. To give you the practical application for this step, we're going to combine it with our personal example. The example we're going to give you has to do with actually saving money toward paying cash for the home that we currently live in. So to give you a practical example, we have an exercise that we'd like you to try. We call it the why exercise. We're going to combine this step with our own personal example. So the story we'll share is our why of why we were saving money to move to a larger home. And you'll see how this exercise works. So the first thing we need to ask ourselves is why do we want to move? So the first item on the agenda was that we needed a larger home. Why do we need a larger home? Our family was increasing. We started out <laughs> with just the two of us in that home, and then we find ourselves with four boys. So our home was getting increasingly smaller. Now, it was a two-bedroom, 856 square feet. It did have a basement, so it had that going for us. But Larry said, I feel like every time I turn around, I'm running into somebody or something. And I said, you know why? Because every time you turn around, you're running into somebody or something. So it was really crowded. So that was that why. Because we wanted to move because our family had gotten larger and the house was smaller. But then you want to go another level down. Why? We wanted to move into a better neighborhood. Why? because we were seeing an increase in crime in the neighborhood that we were in. And it was creating a safety issue for our children. Ah, there, that last why. We got down to the bottom of our why. Why we wanted to move at its core was because we understood that our children were going to be no longer safe in the neighborhood in which we were living. Each time you ask yourself why, go a little bit deeper. And when you get that answer, go a little bit deeper again. By the time you get down, usually we try to ask ourselves why about half a dozen times before we finally get down to what is that transformation that we are seeking and what is it worth to us. It was worth a lot to us, but that bottom line, that why you finally get down to, that is the why that is going to keep you moving forward when it gets really, really hard to reach that goal, or it feels really, really impossible to pay off that debt. We really want you to do this exercise and write down your whys, because when you look at that list, 
those whys, that's your core values. Those are what are important to you. That is the reason that you want this change so badly that you are willing to keep at it even when it is hard. So when you're tempted to get off the track and get off that map that you've laid out for yourself, mm -hmm. you want to think of these why questions. Why am I doing this? Get back on track, stay mm -hmm. on it, and continue the progress. Hey, we want to remind you, you want our help. We've got a set of free goal trackers for you. There's a link to request them in the description of this program. Now we've got you totally psyched about getting in there, figuring out your why, paying off your debt, but you want a little more help. You want some step-by-step -step instructions. We did a video on it. It's got more step-by-step -step stuff and it is right over there. And that's what you want to watch next. It'll make paying off your debt quicker and easier.